The Tom Woods Show, episode 1933. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, if you've decided it's best not to have your kids educated by people who have declared war on you, then consider the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. Instructors like me will give your kids an unfair advantage and an education you and I could only have dreamed of. But make sure you join through my link because only there do you get my $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Jack Posobiec, Senior Editor of Human Events, is with us today. We're going to be talking about his book, The Antifa, Stories from Inside the Black Block. It's weird you talk about Antifa and you're made to feel like there's something wrong with you, even though you're watching buildings burning down and people's businesses being destroyed and you're upset about this and it's apparently there's something wrong with being upset about this. There's something suspicious about you if you find it weird that all this damage keeps being done and almost nobody seems to care about it. Very, very strange. And of course, the coverage is always weird or non-existent or slanted and you want to talk about it. And when you do, you're made to feel like the strange one. It's, it's bizarre. It's like almost like no other topic in American life. So we're going to get to the bottom of it today with Jack. Jack, welcome to the show. Tom, really excited to finally be on. All right. So we're talking about your book about Antifa. And if there's one thing we hear over and over, it's that either it's that Antifa is a quote myth or Antifa is just an idea. It's not an organization. It's just an idea. And I always feel like well, this idea sure is burning down a lot of buildings. So how do you respond, first of all? I mean, I know the answer. I read your book, but how do you answer the, uh, it's, you stupid rubes, you don't even understand it. It's just an idea. Well, I find it very interesting, right? You know, that there's this sort of the knee-jerk mainstream response on the left, and a lot of the neoliberals will respond to this by saying it's just an idea. I would say like, yeah, an idea, like white supremacism or radical Islam or separatism or to, you know, take your pick. There's lots of extremist ideas out there, certainly, right? We are talking about an extremist ideology that drives people to violence through small networks and groups that have centered around that idea. So yes, of course, it's an extremist ideology. I completely agree with you. That's usually how I respond. And that kind of stops them in their tracks when they realize that calling it just an idea is kind of the same thing they talk about all the time, right? You know, the left is actually obsessed with talking about ideas and extremism when they can point it out or tie their political opponents to it. But when it's something that's a little bit closer to home, they try to just kind of paper over it and move along. But can we in fact say that it is an organization? I mean, you point out in here that there's certainly no, there's no hierarchy. There's no central office running the thing. So is it just a spontaneous grouping of individuals in various places or what's really going on? What's the organizational structure like? Sure. Well, I would say that the organizational structure, it takes on various forms uh, the same way that you see in any of these really what they're called as open source movements. And John Robb has a great, you know, does a lot of work on that, but it's really an open source movement. And so there are organizations at regional levels, local levels, and you'll sometimes see those regions working in concert. For example, if there's geographic proximity, like uh, New York, Philadelphia, D.C. is kind of one corridor. And then Portland and Seattle would sort of be the West Coast axis. Then you also see just the Bay Area. You see a lot of groups working together. So these regional nodes of organization really do come together at certain points. And then, of course, Minneapolis, which saw a large influx of people over the George Floyd protests, which turned into riots, which turns into extreme violence, mostly directed at police officers and police precincts, particularly the third precinct there in Minneapolis. But you saw a huge influx of people that were coming into that. Another example of that, where you saw this, this flow, and it's, it's similar to when I was in the intel community, and we would call it foreign fighter flow, going into Syria for the civil war. During Chaz, you saw a very similar situation as that where, so Chaz sort of gets established up in Seattle. That's when they took over, the militants took over essentially a 12 square block radius. And the mayor said, hey, the police are just going to throw this one to the wolves. And so crime was essentially decriminalized there. And uh, then you saw, again, that same influx going in. So it, it flexes, it moves. And it, even in that one, by the way, for Chaz, there were people coming as far as Florida were flying up there just to take part in it and in terms of taking part in the militant, violent parts of it as well. 
you've got some history in here about groups that operated kind of like this group, but in the United States in its current form, where and when did we first see Antifa taking shape, would you say? Sure. So you're absolutely right that this is a phenomenon that really gets its start in Germany, uh, Western Europe, certainly during the, the Cold War. That's when it's really being inculcated even further. Then in the United States, the first time you see kind of some flashes of it are during the early run up to the first Iraq war, the first Gulf War. You see the Black Bloc taking place in Washington, D.C. And then later you see it again really blow onto the scene in 1999 and what they refer to as the Battle of Seattle. And that was the anti globalization protests and riots that took place in Seattle in 1999, the World Trade Organization. And almost ironically, it was over the inclusion of China in the World Trade Organization. Then you fast forward a decade past that, you get what? The Occupy movement. So Zuccotti Park, Occupy Wall Street, which spread to 56 countries around the globe. This Occupy movement, that was sort of the modern birth of the Antifa that we see today. However, the Antifa of today doesn't, interestingly enough, talk about or focus on economic issues as much as the Occupy movement did. Typically, the Antifa you see of today is focused much more on racial issues, social issues, historical issues, and uh, cultural issues by and large. I want to talk about a couple things that are unique to your book here, because you did interviews with people and got information that we didn't have before. And then secondly, you talk about your own experiences with these people. So at which... You know, I've had some run-ins with people online. I haven't come anywhere near what it must have been like being you in some of these situations. But but let's start off. In writing this, apparently you did interview a number of people. You did talk to some people who have inside information about the president's opinions, stuff like that. So in terms of the uniqueness of this book, I think that's one of the aspects of it. So what sort of things did you find in digging around? Well, this is actually interesting. So I was conducting interviews with former White House officials, as well as former and current, I would say, certain members of the intelligence community, national security infrastructure, and the military, asking on the single question of Antifa and when it came to sort of how did 2020 play out in the Oval Office. And a lot of this has actually also now been confirmed by a number of books, um, one that's coming out from a Bloomberg writer, another one that's coming out from New York Times, another one that's a couple of Washington Post guys, when they were looking at the president's uh, wanting to have a draft made up, and there was a draft made up of the Insurrection Act, that he was actually looking at declaring the Insurrection Act using military force to go after these rioters. What I have in my book is the actual conversations that he was having, President Trump, with Chris Ray, the FBI director, sitting across the Resolute desk numerous times. Trump is there with his national security advisor, Robert Bryan, and he's looking at him saying, Chris, what are you doing about Antifa? This group is tearing up these cities. I see it night after night. You need to do something. Tell me what you're doing. And Ray would look at him and say, sir, it's it's overblown. It's not that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. And use that same refrain we just discussed. It's, it's just an idea, really. So that's not something we focus on and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward to about a year later, and we can see that when the FBI wants to go after someone, and they want to prosecute a certain group, like say, for example, the protesters at the Capitol riot from January 6th, well, it goes full bore. You see the posters up in bus stations. You can see tweets going out. Can you identify this person? Can you identify this person? Do you work with this person? Is this someone on your street? Uh, you know, and it'll be like, a, turns out later, it's a 69-year-old lady who's there with her kids, you know, taking selfies in, in the Capitol Rotunda, right? So we know what it looks like when the FBI wants to prosecute a group. But when it comes to Antifa, and we've got there in the book, these interviews were Ray hemmed and hawed. And yes, the president nodded up and down uh, about going after them and never brought things to that level. Well, it certainly seems as if there's, uh, <laughs> this is the most obvious observation of the whole year, there's some kind of double standard here. Because if there were all kinds of right-wing violence sweeping the country, and uh, local officials were turning a blind eye to it and the police were standing down, I don't think we'd be saying, well, you know, we, I don't think there's anything we can really do here because it's really just an idea, not a... We'd never hear the end of it. This would demonstrate everything they've said about white supremacy being the biggest problem facing America. There's some kind of a 
blind spot here. And yet the thing is, Antifa's going after the courthouses, the the symbols of the of the regime. And yet you would think the Justice Department would realize that you're not exactly they're not going to exempt you because you didn't like Trump either. It's not like you're going to get away. It's like libertarians who think if I'm just nice to the New York Times, they'll be friendly to me. No, they despise you as much as they despise any of us. So it's weird to me that the DOJ would kind of yawn when looking at this. Well, so here's the the interesting dichotomy of what's going on. is, And you're exactly right in saying that, yes, they are aiming at those things, at least in terms of their rhetoric, and then certainly in terms of places like Portland. But... The interesting thing that is actually happening, and this is something that bears out through the book, and I mentioned it before, how they don't seem to focus as much on economic issues as they used to. It really seems as though the current band of Antifa has been co-opted by people who are actually in power in places like Washington, in places like New York, in places like Silicon Valley, to go after their preferred political opponents rather than focus on what their you know, original stated goals were, which is, of course, insurrection and the replacement of the U.S. government with some form of anarcho-communism. But because they've now been co-opted, it's almost like, and it's not almost like, frankly, it is exactly, they are given a pass. They are treated with a light touch. You know, there are instances, of course, where Antifa is prosecuted, and that's when they cross the line and you've got evidence against somebody, but you don't see these major programs going against them. And you see the constant downplaying of them in media reports and in official reports from the DHS or FBI and others. And I really dig into this in the book. And this is something where it's kind of unique because I have the background of having been on both sides of the table of this because I am a former intelligence officer myself. And I've seen what it's like. In fact, I was just at a a movie premiere for Plot Against the President in Washington, D.C. last week. And some former colleagues of mine showed up and, you know, some folks that I've don't really talk to in person that much anymore. But they said, Jack, it's 10 times worse than when you were there. And that was just five years ago because the amount of groupthink, the amount of circular reporting, parallel reporting that's being done in there is atrocious. These people, these analysts within the intelligence community and the DOJ and the national security state, they're watching the Washington Post. They're watching CNN because they're all stuck home on pandemic, right? They were all on lockdown for a full year. So they're not having access to any of their classified systems. They're watching MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, The Washington Post, and then they're regurgitating this stuff as if it's intelligence. I kid you not, that's actually what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now. Well, it's unbelievable. And not to mention, you have to endure people saying to you, well, look, it's right in their name. They're anti-fascist. So if you're against fascism, you should agree with them. I've actually had an argument at that IQ level thrown at me numerous times. If I'm against fascism, I should support them. The thing is, there is no fa in Antifa. There is no fascism in the U.S. I'm just going to just say it just straight up. There is nothing resembling fascism in the U.S. today. If I were to list all the, the different planks that we might associate with fascism, they're not really how I would describe the ruling ideology, or they're Absolutely not how I would describe Trump. You have to be kidding me. There's no resemblance whatsoever. What, because Trump wants to limit immigration? What, like like half the countries of the world? So what does that mean? Japan, which has almost no immigration. Japan is fascist. This is just stupid. This, these are the kids who really did, they really did absorb what they learned in third grade about history. And that's about as, as far as it goes. So given that there, I assume you agree with me, there is no fascism. What are they talking about? What is their actual agenda? What are they actually trying to do? Well, so it's actually quite interesting. And this is a part where delving into the history is quite useful in understanding what's going on here with that very same situation that you just talked about. That dynamic was actually the same thing that was going on all the way back at the founding of Antifa in 1932 in Weimar, Germany. Because all the way back then, now here's what's really interesting, is as, as you say, the situation in America today, it does not resemble the political situation, maybe economically, but politically, we don't have the same situation as Weimar Germany because there were actual fascists in Weimar Germany and they were quite open about that fact. But what's so interesting for people to understand is that the original Antifa was founded by the Soviets in Weimar Germany 
as an attempt to take over Germany for communism. That was their stated goal. And as such, they did not view people like the National Socialist Workers' Party, Adolf Hitler, and the rest of them as their major opponents. They viewed their opponents as who? The social Democrats of their age, the Social Democrat Party, because they viewed them as the establishment. This came down straight from Stalin. This came down straight from Moscow. They were told, you need to target the status quo. You need to target any institution that is holding that up, whether it be a bank, whether it be a church, whether it be a corporation, schools, etc. These all need to be destroyed so that we can overthrow society and institute communism. Because current society, again, through the lens of a Marxist-Leninist, is what they would consider social fascism. So if you want the real understanding of what why they're called Antifa, sure, they believe that they're anti-fascist, but they're not talking about textbook fascism. They're talking about the fascism of today's society. And that's exactly as it was at their founding. An interesting you know, kind of way to sort of explain this to people is, you know, the Berlin Wall, right? The the Berlin Wall. Everybody knows the Berlin Wall that separated East and West Berlin during the Cold War. That's what we called it here in the West. But do you know what they actually called it and what they referred it to in official Of course, it's the anti-fascist barrier. The <laughs> anti-fascist barrier. So again, that gives you, it's a propaganda term of art used by communists to smear their opponents. And the key point here is it has always been a communist turn of phrase a piece of propaganda since its very inception. Yeah, that is an excellent point. That is an excellent point. So we shouldn't be surprised if in 2020 and 2021, we hear it used in exactly that way. And it boggles your mind because you look at it through the lens of history and we say, wait a minute, you mean Antifa, even back at the start, when, <laughs> when actually Adolf Hitler was around, they were still being told to go after the Democrats and the establishment parties, not the actual rise. And here's what they would say, is they would say, well, we think those guys are going to take over, but they'll fail. And after Hitler, it'll be our turn. That's literally what they used to say. Oh, boy. And you can imagine what happened to most of the leaders of the original Antifa. I probably don't even need to say it. And you've seen, uh, what's the name of that? I, I wrote an email about him, but there was a, you probably know the case of a, there was a musician who, who recently left his band because he, he liked- It was Andy in uh, Mumford Nose and books. Sons, yeah. That's right, Mumford and Sons, that's right. Because just because he said, hey, this is, you know, an important book and, you know, extremism is a bad thing. And, and just, it was, you are a hateful bastard. And the, the responses he got, so you couldn't even say, some of the things these people are doing are really deplorable. I mean, I don't really want the, I don't really want these buildings burned down and people terrorized and- people to be afraid to speak their minds. You can't say that. Right. You so, cannot say, there's a mob that comes after you. This is a problem that's emblematic, but also the power dynamics there are very important for people to understand. And so I want people to see that power dynamic for what it is and understand that we currently in the US, if you're you know someone who's a center-right or a libertarian, a conservative, a traditionalist, you know the whole hodgepodge of it, or even just someone who would consider themselves a classic liberal, you do not have something in the U.S. that's called cultural cachet, right? The left, the institutional left has cultural hegemony right now in the United States. So, you know, this is everything they used to accuse the Christian right, right, in the 80s and 90s of being, that's the left of today. So if you speak out, if you commit blasphemy, if you say something that is sacrilegious, that is considered sacrilegious, you have now committed an act of heresy, you are an apostate, and you either must be censored, you must be brought into the public square. And, uh, you know, we we're actually just driving, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I was on vacation with my family in New England, and we were driving up through Salem, Massachusetts. And we stopped, and my wife wanted to see the, the museum, the witch trial museum, and everything. And one thing we, we found out was that most of the people who, now 19 were executed back then, but if you confessed, right, if you confessed, then you would only be, right, only be ostracized from the community, right? They were put through struggle sessions. This was a mass hysteria of the 1690s, right? And this, is, of course, is not unique. This was, had gone on in Europe in the past. And so now this is like the witch trials of today, 
that if you commit one of these acts, well, you're considered as if you're practicing witchcraft to even have discussions like the one you and I are having right now, where we can look at verifiable facts and say that they're going on. And yet you are not supposed to because the ruling power, right, the cotton mathers of today are saying that to do so is to commit heresy. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Stamps.com. We're seeing normal life returning, even to some of the most previously locked down places. Big events coming back. We're excited to do all kinds of things, but going to the post office is not one of them. I even got to the point where I hired somebody to take my packages to the post office for me just because it takes up so much of my time and it disrupts what I'm trying to do, and nobody likes standing in line. Well, if you're like me, Stamps.com is just what the doctor ordered. They make it easy for small businesses to mail and ship without having to take that trip to the post office. You can print official U.S. postage and shipping labels 24-7 without having to leave your desk or buy any fancy equipment. All you need is your computer and a standard printer. Once your mail's ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. It's that simple. Stamps.com saves nearly 1 million small business owners like you time and money. They offer deals you can't get anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS and up to 66% off UPS shipping rates. So stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code WOODS, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in WOODS. That's stamps.com, promo code WOODS. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Let's talk about an incident involving you that we could pick more than one, but I couldn't remember the exact details of what went on. So as I was reading, you know, the excitement was building. I I don't remember how this comes out. And I'm talking in particular about the so-called Deplora Ball, the the big event you had celebrating the inauguration. So you wound up having a hotel weasel out of hosting you. And then you had it at the National Press Club. And then I wondered if they were going to back down. But as it happens... The thing went on, but not without incident. So can you describe that? And I mean, you were named by name by these people as as a target. You know, it's very interesting because everybody talks about, you know, the peaceful transfer of power. And they say, uh, and January 6th, of course, is in the national conversation, so forced into the conversation by the mainstream right now. And yet there is a complete ignorance of the fact that there were hundreds of people who incited riots and attacked the inauguration of Donald Trump. And that's just a historic fact. That's just history, right? That's not something where you don't have to be a Trump supporter to to say that that happened. That happened. It just happened, right? It's something that that happened in our country. So violence broke out at Trump's inauguration, including at the night before at the Deplora Ball, which was an inaugural ball, over a thousand people that I hosted. We rented the National Press Club. And prior to that, I had heard what we'd say in the IC, we call it INW, indications and warnings, that a group called Antifa was planning an operation called Disrupt J20. And so Disrupt J20 was their name for the operation of the attack. On, this is, again, a very sophisticated, planned out attack with strategies, with affinity groups for attacking the inauguration. So this is before they kind of knew my face. I had yet to be on uh, One American News and everything else. So I wasn't as well known. So I go to their actual planning meetings. This is December of 16, so it's after the election, but you know, prior to inauguration. And I'm sitting there in a church basement, Northwest DC, and they start saying, hey, not only are we going to attack the election, by the way, but there's this ball going on the night before that's held by uh, a bunch of Trump supporters and this guy, Jack Posobiec, and we're going to attack that and we're going to show them that they're not welcome here in Washington, DC. Well, little did they know, that Jack Posobiec was actually sitting there in the room, taking down notes and recording them as they were saying all of this. And later, Jack Posobiec sent all of that information to who? The Secret Service, the FBI, (laughs) the the DC Police Department, Metropolitan Police Department, and by the way, Project Veritas, who was able to run their own sting later on of the same group. But I got to tell you, even though the police did come out and eventually sent... um, we had probably several dozen police officers that were there at the press club. There were hundreds of Antifa in the streets attacking us, attacking our guests, trying to do everything they could, setting fires, throwing batteries at us, throwing whatever they had, eggs, et cetera, to prevent us from simply going inside. And by the way, this was, you know, pretty, you know, we, we had to rent out the entire press club. So, you know, ticket prices were not cheap for this thing. 
you know, people were showing up in evening gowns and evening wear, and the men were all wearing suits to get inside. And the police had to provide essentially uh, almost like a phalanx of riot shields and protection for people to be coming in in, you know, with groups of like twos and threes as they came in. I had to run down because my fiance, my wife now, was trying to get in with my parents and we were able to sneak them in kind of through a side door. And it was absolute insanity, right? And uh, this was huge, by the way. Fox News covered it. MSNBC covered it. It was the only thing going on the night before. Were you scared, by the way? Were you scared as this was happening? Uh... I mean, I know it's, you know, you're, you know, alpha male, of course, nothing, but, but these are all crazy people, right? Anything could happen. Really, on, honestly, when it comes down to it, in a situation like that, you know, I, I know it's cliche to say it, but I, I sort of try to fall back on my training and I say, all right, you know, what's the situation? What's the outcome that I'm looking for? What's my strategic goal? What's strategic intent here? So how do we accomplish, you know, getting from point A to point B, you know, with the least amount of uh, risk, at least amount of casualties, whatever it might be. So, you know, that's just kind of the mode you go into when you're in a situation like that. And for me, it was, it was really just, I mean, that wasn't a factor. The factor was I need to keep my family safe and I need to do anything I can to keep my family safe. Right. Well, fair enough. Okay. I'm sorry. I interrupted the story, but I'm just trying to imagine myself in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back, uh, it, it is kind of wild to realize that that went on and that certainly wasn't the first time that, you know, we kind of went up against Antifa. But interestingly enough, later on, we continued to hold events in D.C. and in that that area. But what we would do is we would actually post publicly like a fake address that we were going to send people to because we knew that Antifa would later get that address. And then we would data mine all the people who bought tickets to the events for later on to make sure that we would really kind of vet the guest list over and over. So those internally would then get a separate address, whereas publicly we would be saying, oh, it's this other place, go to this other place. So we're using sort of an old military trick on that. So that Antifa would then go to this other place, start protesting there, start screaming. And then they would come out and say, we don't know what you're talking about because there's nobody here. Uh, I think the last time we did it, we sent them like two states over and then they finally found out like halfway through the night where we were. And by the time they got back to D.C., we were already inside. That's insane. Now, meanwhile, the press obviously has a bias and we don't, we don't get the kind of outrage about this sort of thing that you might expect if there weren't such a bias. But what about the general public? Forget the press. That, that's just, they're just hopeless. What about the general public? Is there any way to get a sense of how they feel about all this? So it's, it's interesting, right? Because you do encounter a wall and you, it's not so much that they have the bias of the mainstream media, but I've always said the mainstream media's greatest power isn't necessarily their bias, it's their story selection bias. So the fact that the mainstream media doesn't talk about Antifa, doesn't give them the time, doesn't give them coverage, or when they do, it's either positive or it's extremely minimal, that creates this sense that they don't exist because why, well, how could they exist? I don't hear about it on the news, right? That's sort of the you know, the perception there. And it also becomes a huge problem because when this group does start committing violence in someone's city, they then are, you know, the local population, the people who live there, the residents, for example, Chaz up in Seattle was a type of this, where they had no idea what was going on. They were completely abandoned by their city. People who lived in that area, people who had businesses in that area that were ransacked, that were set on fire, they're thinking specifically of this car dealership that was in the area where someone broke in, they were stealing keys, they set fire to it. A mob was breaking down the fence the one night while I was there um, recording. And so these people are not only in one sense abandoned by their government, but they're in many cases clueless as to the actual militancy that's going on because they aren't being served by the journalists who are supposed to be there operating in the public good. The whole thing is extremely frustrating because I've also heard it said that, well, it's true that these people may commit property crimes, but, you know, the, we've, we've heard the usual defense of that. These properties, of course, have insurance. Now, okay, two things about that. <laughs> Number one, your premium is going to go up and up and up and up if this keeps on happening. You know, insurance companies are not registered charities. But secondly, there are sometimes clauses that exclude rioting as uh, something that, you know, you could be made whole from. So that's, that's another problem. But 
of course, the whole flippant attitude of, oh, they have insurance is, is juvenile and, and evil in itself. But what they'll say is, yeah, they commit property crimes, but only the right-wing extremists actually kill people. Only they have actually committed murder. These are, you know, whatever mayhem you may attribute to Antifa, they're not generally killing people. Yeah, I mean, even even then, I mean, and you're absolutely right, by the way, on the, you know, that someone who says that they have no idea how the insurance business works or they you know, probably have never actually owned any, any business or property on their own. But when it comes to the body count of Antifa, not only does it exist, but it's actually rising. So Antifa in 2019 in Dayton, Ohio, had their first mass shooter. and His name was Connor Betts. This was a guy who was uh, deeply involved in Antifa, who had participated in Antifa marches, Antifa protests. And later on in one evening, this is following the El Paso shooting, which of course made national headlines, horrific shooting that happened down there. Then Dayton, Ohio, this guy commits his own mass shooting. AR-15 uh, goes into a very populated nightlife area of Dayton, Ohio, and just begins indiscriminately shooting people. He's then taken out by police. So fast forward to 2020 in Chaz, we saw the sort of proto Lord of the Flies-esque you know, kind of, or if you've ever seen season three of The Wire, kind of dynamics really breaking out very quickly because during the day, Chaz almost seemed like a hippie jam fest. But at night, that's when the criminal element started to bleed into it. And we saw when I was personally there that the level of tension was ratcheting up and ratcheting up and ratcheting up, not only from the militants that were manning the barricades at the borders to this thing, the sort of entrance exit points on the streets, but in terms of the gangs, the criminal gangs that were operating within those spaces after hours. It was a few nights after we left that the first shooting started taking place. And all in all, there ended up being five shootings on four separate occasions within Chaz. At one point, it was a couple of African-American teenagers who were joyriding with this, um, you know, this white Jeep that they had stolen. And they were driving up to the barricade of Chaz and the militants that we're told started opening fire and uh, shot up one, killed the other. And the police have not been able to figure out exactly what happened because once they realized what they had done, the militants then collected all of the evidence, cleaned it all up, the shell casings, and et cetera, and then fled the scene, right? So they actually prevented the police from knowing what was going on and preventing them from even investigating what was going on. Though I should say that there are some, I have heard from my sources in law enforcement that there are some suspects that they're looking into very, very, very closely because they've been able to identify through other sources, specifically in Seattle. Then actually out in Seattle, one of the other killings that took place, just a horrific killing that happened, was in the tent city that was going on that had sort of built up around Chaz that attracted a large homeless population. So the homeless are coming in, they're doing drugs. And this one guy who was involved, you remember that the Chaz farm that, that had gone up? This guy ends up murdering his girlfriend, sort of a camp wife that he had had in her sleep, driving nails through her head in the tent. Then police start chasing him after that they find out this happened. They start chasing him through the tent city. He holds up in a tool shed that he had known about that was sort of in this public park overnight. They don't want to go bust in. So the police wait for him for a couple hours until daybreak. And then at daybreak, they go in, they're knocking on the door, knocking on the door. They can't hear the guy. They finally bust in and it turns out that he's drowned himself in, they later find there's a vat of bleach inside the tool shed. And so he drowned himself there. So, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks from, to when I was there, I'm filming this guy sort of, you know, tending and, and going around the Chaz farm. And then later on, he's going on to commit horrific murder-suicide within the very same confines. Holy cow. I don't know how I missed that story. Well, I guess I do know how I missed that story. <laughs> now that I think about well, because it, it's, Seattle, it's Seattle, you know? Yeah. Jeez, that's unbelievable. So, Which, and by the way, you know, when I, whenever I talk about that one, yes, it's of course tied to... Uh, the Chaz and the, and the Antifa situation there. But, you know, I always have people from uh, Los Angeles saying, oh, Jack, you should, if you think that's bad, you should see what's going on out here in LA. Well, look, I always, at least in principle, want to leave people with some feeling of hope. And yet what we've seen is this crazy, violent movement that 
thinks it's surrounded by fascism, defines fascism completely tendentiously, demonizes dissident voices, and the media either doesn't report on it or whitewashes it or explains it away or claims it's just an idea and not a thing. It's hard to end this on an up note. Can you can you do that? I can. I can actually. I can because when I tied them to the institutional left, and I, I do see them as a symptom of the rise of the institutional left because any other serious, credible institution of law enforcement would have taken care of this very, very quickly and then would have prevented a situation where there would be no repeats, no copycats, because they would be very clear. They say political violence is not acceptable and they would be taken care of. Then you see the push, though, of the institutional left that's gone now through the media, through academia, and is driving into the schools. They've gone too far. And you see parents now banding together, forming groups, and fighting back against what's going on in the schools. And to see those parents starting these groups, and, and some of these places like Loudoun County, Virginia, these, these are very, very wealthy, very deep-pocketed areas. They're now starting or, um, national institutions and national organizations specifically to fight the spread of leftism and leftist ideas in our schools and in our institutions. That is going to absolutely have a secondary effect of asking people to stop giving these things a pass. We're going to stop giving critical race theory a pass. We're going to stop giving these crazy lectures, these racial lectures in our military a pass, right? Chairman Milley coming out and saying that white rage is the biggest problem in the U.S. military. No, absolutely not, right? And at the same time, it's going to have an effect of having people stop pretending that we live in this false reality that's perpetuated by the institutional left and wake up to what's actually going on in the country, the skyrocketing crime, out of control crime in all of our major cities, and voting in a backlash of politicians against the institutional left. And even at the local boards, the school boards, community board, whatever it is, to go after them and say, no, enough is enough. And you're now seeing funding against this. You're seeing organization against this, where I really do believe that because they've gone so far that you're now seeing, and by the way, when I say these are parents, I mean, they are just normal parents. They're not tied to any institutional conservative money or Republican money or anything like this at all. They are just regular people who have said enough is enough. And because I see that happening more and more, I really do think that it's going to have a snowball effect across the country. All right. Well, you did rise to the occasion when I gave you that challenge. All right. Fair enough. Good, good, good. All right. Well, another step people can take, of course, is to read your book, which I'll urge them to do. It's at tomwoods.com slash 1933. And the book, of course, is The Antifa, Stories from Inside the Black Block by our guest, Jack Posobiec. Well, Jack, thanks for your time and for doing this. And you know, I like just sitting behind my keyboard. I don't I don't want somebody naming me by name and chasing after me and I got to be taken by security inside a build. You know, you seem more suited to that than I am, but continued good luck to you. Thank you so much, Ty. I appreciate it. God bless. All right, folks, before we wrap up for today, I want to direct your attention to some work that one of my listeners is doing, and that is over at macrometsrealestate.com. Macro Meets Real Estate is a weekly newsletter providing useful and funny commentary on the economy and real estate investing. And the author is an experienced professional with over $6 billion worth of transaction experience in multifamily, self-storage, student housing, hospitality, senior housing, and industrial investments. He is coming at this from an Austrian school perspective. He covers economic and real estate news and also provides real estate tips and a weekly deep dive into a topic like inflation, stimulus, the hottest segments of the real estate market, and much more. And then for fun, every week there's a segment called Offending Your Delicate Sensibilities, where the author puts forth an opinion on a controversial topic and readers are encouraged to provide thoughtful rebuttals, which may be published in a future issue. And the purpose is to encourage thoughtful and respectful dialogue rather than social media mudslinging that we're all too accustomed to. So to get your copy of the newsletter fresh to your inbox every Friday morning, visit macrometsrealestate.com. That's macrometsrealestate.com. I'm going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1933. And of course, remember, if you're thinking of starting a website, but you're afraid when you launch it, it's just going to be tumbleweeds going by because who's going to find out about it? Old Woods here is going to help you out. I'll give you a nice boost here on the show and give you other benefits for free that are going to give you an unfair advantage out of the gate. How do you get my free goodies and bonuses? Well, before you start that site, 
Check out the details at tomwoods.com slash publicity. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.